Venice, the incomparable city, and Bugatti, the incomparable car, each the epitome of art in design. And now both legends stand together. There is a component in our car that is uh, the art. They, they have an expression, if you can do something that you love to do, like working on the cars and being involved in them, it's like dying and going to heaven. It's just a fabulous car, you know, it's, uh, it handles beautifully, it's got loads of power, it's got nice little narrow tyres, so, you know, you can put the car where you want it. It's a, just a very, very good old car. For an insight into the passion that stirs Bugatti enthusiasts the world over, there's no better place to start than this thousand metres of tarmac, winding up a steep Gloucestershire hillside, Prescott Hill Climb. You'll find Bugattis here, as well as the contemporary competition like Bentley, Morgan three-wheelers, and even this fearsome six-litre GM Special. This hill climb is all about. The Bugatti Owners Club bought this estate in 1937 and had their first hill climb here in 1938. And the cars have been sprinting up here ever since. Now today is a classic meeting with everything from modern racing cars through classic sports cars, Allards, Jaguars, you name it. But the epitome of Prescott Hill Climb is that glorious sound of tearing calico, a Bugatti on full song. Bugatti drivers know and love their charges, but they can appreciate their shortcomings too. Rodney Felton with his superb 1923 example. Known as the Brecci Bugatti, which is a Type 13 Bugatti. Um, this was the difficulty to believe. This was the Grand Prix car of the 1920s. This ran at Le Mans, the races of that era. Now you see a modern Grand Prix driver, and you think, you know, that must be a really difficult job. But to do a Grand Prix in this must have been quite something for those drivers. Yes, I think it must have been comparable for the year, because the road surface was uh, dust and dirt and gravel, and furthermore, they did them with quite some length, 500 miles. And these would average 90, 90 miles, 95 miles an hour plus for that period of time. On these sort of narrow tires? Yes, on narrow tires. That's and what sort of brakes have you got on this? Terrible. Terrible break, uh, so you have to be a little bit careful. And I think that you can see the old films where they, they lose speed through sliding them. I mean, they must have gone through tyres quite fast. Time. In the four years before the First World War, a Tory Bugatti had set up his factory and made his name in motor racing. But it was the 1920s, the golden years, when his cars swept all before them. A win at Le Mans in 1920 was to herald 2,000 major racing victories. And 75 years later, Bugatti was back at Le Mans, this time a solitary example of an EB110, a car produced by a new Italian company bearing that proud name. After lying a creditable sixth overall, the car hit major problems. Five turbochargers had to be changed, and the car finally halted in the last 45 minutes of the race. But the broken-hearted Italians vowed they would return. After all, they aspire to a truly great racing heritage, as the cars at Prescott show. And Charlie Dean, I mean, this sums up for me the epitome of a, of a real racing car. What is it? Well, really, it's a derivative of the last racing Bugatti, and it has um, a 4.7-litre engine, which was derived from an earlier Bugatti engine, which was a 5-litre, with a steel block, a uh, cast iron block. This has an aluminium block and a lot of magnesium on it. It was built for the um, sub-750 kilogram formula and uh, in a kind of last-ditch attempt by Bugatti to beat the Germans. And, and what sort of power output does it deliver? It's um, on petrol at the moment and probably about 350, something like that. On, on methanol, on alcohol fuel, more like 450. You know, containing that sort of power through this sort of chassis, it must be a very exciting ride. Um, yes, I'll tell you when I find out. <laughs> 
a fearsome car, but then Bugatti was always at the cutting edge of high performance. This is Black Bess, a Type 19 racing car, which left the Bugatti factory at Molsheim in 1913. It was Bugatti's only car to feature Chain Drive, a sister car ran at Indianapolis where Bugatti impressed the Americans as much for his engineering skill as his sartorial elegance. Today, Black Bess is maintained in the Oxfordshire workshops of Ivan Dutton, a mecca for Bugatti enthusiasts from all over the world. Well, I spent a lifetime in cars, and my father in cars before me, and when I was a kid during the war, they used to talk about nothing else but Brooklands and Bugattis and stuff like that. And then I went off modern racing and did all the things that young blokes do, probably, and then eventually it came back to the Bugatti, really, and um, I decided to get involved in them, and I got involved in them, and now, really, there's no other car because I can see the magic of them. Bugatti's often called a genius with metal, but was he a magician as well? Well, I don't think he was so much a magician. I think really he come from a, a family of artists. Um, they'd obviously, from a little boy, they probably thought about nothing else but line and form and what have you. So when it comes to designing a car, he obviously used all the artistic background that he got. So he not only made the thing work, but he made it look beautiful. And obviously, there are funny things like the crankshaft. I mean, he, he designed this unbelievable roller-bearing crankshaft, which when you look at it, is a very funny design. But when the days when there was no oil available, I mean, this thing would probably have run on cooking oil if it had needed to. And so they could drive it for 300 miles in Targa Floria, flat out, never break, never give any trouble, because it was a roller bearing crankshaft. And every little bit he made, he, he obviously looked at it and thought, well, no, that doesn't look quite right. We'll make it look beautiful. And, and that's exactly what it does. Beautiful looking they might be, but Bugattis could be temperamental, just like Le Patron himself, who could take a pretty cavalier attitude to owners' reliability and maintenance problems. One man famously complained his car had broken down. See, it doesn't happen again, was the curt reply from Bugatti. No such complaints about Black Bess. Even after 80 years, her engine is still going strong. Now, this is the heart of Black Bess, a five-litre, four-cylinder engine. That's over a litre per cylinder. The, the biggest four-cylinder on the market today is Porsche's two-and-a-half-litre unit. So you can just imagine how big the pistons must be. And I think it's a far more attractive piece of machinery to look at than today's computer-controlled, catalyzed devices. This is real torque. Not to mention 100 brake horsepower delivered at a leisurely 2,400 RPM. Highly efficient for those days. So, Ivan, how do I start this beauty? Retired ignition, couple of pumps on the handle. What, then it locks in position? Locks in position. Yeah. Press the starter and advance the ignition when it starts. Then it's into first, ease off the handbrake, thankfully a lot more effective than the foot-operated transmission brake, and off on one of the most deeply satisfying drives I've ever taken. Black Bess's life is known almost from the day it left the factory. Bugatti was a great friend of early French aviator Roland Garros, who ordered a Type 18 chassis and then had installed upon it a sporting two-seater body. When the First World War broke out, Garros took his Bugatti to the front with him, and he became one of France's top air aces. But he was killed in the air just three weeks before the armistice. His beloved Bugatti passed to the chief engineer of the Sunbeam Company, who brought the car to England. In the early 1920s, it was sold to a decidedly sporting young lady, Miss Ivy Cummings, who promptly gave it the name Black Bess after Dick Turpin's horse. Black Bess appeared at Prescott on many occasions, and Ivan's no stranger to the course either. He holds the record for Bugattis. Type 35B, and uh, it's really the racing car that Bugatti arrived at by 1930. Um, and obviously, it's a lot more powerful, and it's a much completely different car to a 1914 car. Um, when, when, when we were at your workshop, this was in very small pieces. That's right. We were busy working on it, getting it ready for today. Um, and really, we only just finished it. We're still 
running in, as they would say. <laughs> now, this is a, a supercharged car. I mean, how powerful was it in its heyday? Um, well, I think in the heyday, it probably gave just as much power as they give today, because they used to run them on alcohol fuel then. We run it on alcohol fuel now. We think we're probably approaching 180 brake horsepower. And that's 180 brake horsepower going through a tyre which is what, four inches wide? Yeah. Is, yeah. It, is it a real handful? No, it isn't really, but it, it is. It, it does make for a lovely car because you have to you have to be sensible. You can't just jam your foot down on the throttle because if you did, you just go off. So you have to feed the power in it. And halfway through a corner, you know, you could just put a bit more power on and get the tail out. So it's, it's a lovely thing to drive. The worship of Bugatti has sometimes ventured into the obsessional. Mill owners, the Schlumpf brothers, built up a secret hoard of cars at Malou's, a collection which only came to light in 1977 when their company crashed and angry workers broke in to discover 110 Bugattis. This is the car that so many people come to Malou's to see. It's literally the star of the show. It's one of only six Bugatti Royales. Now, this is the incredible Coupe Napoleon, which was designed by Jean Bugatti for his father to use in the factory. If you were cynical, you could say he used it because he couldn't sell it to anybody else. One of the reasons there were only six made was that uh, you had to be fabulously rich, even by the standards of the 30s, to even contemplate only one of these. While the Royale is worth many millions, every Bugatti is worth a small fortune. But owners don't like to talk about values, and they don't want to see the cars rot in museums. They want to drive them at events like this, an international Bugatti meeting held in Italy last year, when over a hundred cars from all over the world converged on the ancient centre of Cremona. Cars which in many cases have been in the same family for generations or have been restored from little more than boxes of bits. The owners came not just to polish and admire each other's toys, but to put their cars to a stiff test of performance and endurance. The event started gently enough with a time trial round a small circuit just outside the town. The racers snarled and squealed their way round, but the bigger coach-built saloons stood on their dignity. But then it was down to serious business and a long, fast road section to the next halt in Mantua, home of another motor racing legend, Nuvolari. In the square at Mantua, the cars were prepared for a Concorde d'Elegance later that night, but for some entrants, there was welcome time for urgent attention. Dutch driver Simon Klopp, in one of the most spectacular cars on the event, had been having trouble most of the day. I have a problem with the gearbox. The, uh, the oil runs out, and uh, I have to check it daily and uh, top it up a bit. It's a beautiful car. What is it? It's a uh, Type 57 SC Atlantique. S is for the low chassis, the C is for the compressor, and Atlantique is the body shape. It's a, it's a fantastic looking car. It is, and especially if you uh, notice that this is from 1936, the design. So it, uh, it's really a miracle. And it's, uh, I drove it from Holland to, uh, to here. So we did some uh, 1,600 kilometers with it. And it's, uh, it's a real GT. It's a very gone to Gizmo car. And, uh, it's fabulous. Next morning, as dawn broke, all was still in the square. But soon, drivers were up and about. Today, the cars are travelling from Mantua right across to Venice, a long, gruelling trip in the high Italian temperatures. How many of the Bugattis will survive and how many will finish the day on the truck like this? Already, some had problems. One car was losing a steady stream of water and consuming oil at a frightening rate. Now this is the true mark of the Bugatti enthusiast, the cap on backwards. Uh, it helps aerodynamics, I'm told. Absolutely, absolutely. 
What, what is the car? It's a Type 37, um, delivered in Switzerland in April 1926. And uh, had a little trouble this morning, but uh, it looks like she's running. How did, how did you come by the car? Um, we found it in a chicken coop in Switzerland in 1981 and um, managed to uh, prize it away from its owner. As the cars hit the road, the escorting EB110s took up their positions. How did Britain's Bugatti importer Nick Lancaster enjoy the experience? Well, I have to say that um, perhaps I shouldn't say this as a, as a car dealer, but actually I'd rather be one of the older cars. <laughs> Nevertheless, actually, they've, they've done a lot of work to make a, what Bugatti would have actually liked to have had happen had he not actually capitulated in the early 50s. So I think it's a supercar. Love it. Bugatti would have approved of the route too. It said he would vet aspiring Type 35 customers, sending them on wild drives around the factory to see if they possessed a Bugatti seat, the instinct to handle the car and sense it through the seat of their pants. Conserve the gas. With perfect Bugatti seats, Barry Parkinson and his co-driver Dot prepared for a pit stop. This is a very traditional English scene by the side of the main road. Well, it is a very traditional uh, with us, wherever we go uh, on the continent. Uh, it's like, gets about this time, about 11 o'clock, and uh, you think, right, just a suitable lay-by. Well, we always take the table and chairs, we're fully equipped, as you can see. But there's a pizzeria across the road there. Oh, well, you know, being only of modest means. <laughs> 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 you don't trust the Italian coffee? Well, you know, these meals, you don't know whether you want. You're giving away, are you? Thousands and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's all these oughts. It's very confusing. <laughs> We're finding the Italian money very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you had your, your Bugatti, Barry? Oh, the Bugatti, yes, the Tarot 40. Uh, I bought it in bits in 1981. And it finally got put together uh, about four years ago. It's, it's the only one in uh, in Lancashire, is it? No, 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 no. I, I was fortunate when I was putting it together. There's another one in Lancashire very near, and he lent it me to copy the body. This is a new body which I built. But all the mechanical parts are original Bugatti. Now, they talk about uh, sort of golf widows. I mean, what, what happens to ladies on Bugatti runs? Do you get very bored with all this talk about the cars? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As the afternoon wore on, the pace quickened, for 30 of the cars had an appointment with destiny in Venice. And upping the pace meant upping the strain. A Bugatti guru, uh, Hugh Conway, what's, what's gone wrong here? Well, we've got Eric Van Essen's car, and it was a very simple job. In fact, the union holding the carburetor had just come loose. But the, car the carburetor's right the, down there. Well, the interesting thing about these engines is they're 2.3 litre supercharged. The supercharger is here. It's a Roots-type blower. That means the carburetor is right underneath. So if you ever see one of these cars, we're always right down underneath, on our backs, if you like. <laughs> That traditional Bugatti driver pose was all too evident further down the road. But all the cars destined for display in Venice made it to the rendezvous on time. Now, if you were told your car was to be transported to the heart of Venice, you might have expected some sort of car ferry. But this is Italy. Pushed by an ancient tug, millions of pounds worth of precious machinery slowly floated out into the lagoon and down to the Grand Canal on a rusty pontoon. Cars are, are beautifully built. Uh, we always compare the engines and the mechanical works to a Swiss watch. And uh, people think that because the designs are very delicate, the cars are delicate too, but they're not, they're very strong. The prospect of a perilous transition from Pontoon to San Marco Square had some drivers' hearts in their mouths and others reaching for their swimming costumes. I had a swimming crayons in my car, so I was waiting that we had a gem in the water, but it's okay. We are very happy to be here and I think it will be great. <laughs> Yeah. 
You know, you don't know what the Italians do, it's always the Italian way, and they can't do it properly the first time, so I'm worrying very much. But the fears proved groundless, and after some very careful manoeuvring, the cars made their way ashore. As soon as these ones in the front get out of the road, we're going to take a wee run at it. We'll jump it. And at last, for the first time in the history of that ancient city of canals and waterways, cars moved over the hallowed flagstones of the Doge's Palace in San Marco Square. Well, it's pretty special. Um, I don't think this has uh, happened before, but um, the Italians are pretty proud of uh, Bugatti, Bugatti, and uh, they're pretty proud of all this, so they managed to get them both together. But hardly a traditional Bugatti colour, yeah, well, you know what Aussies are like. They like to um, they like to do the non-traditional thing. Um, there's plenty of blue ones, but not too many yellow. The cars attracted intense interest on the waterfront, with crowds of admiring visitors to such an extent that irate gondoliers complaining their business was being affected had to be taken away by the police. But by the next day, all was calm again. Anyway, this was history in the making. Well, today is a, a day of rest for the cars and the crews, and a chance for everyone to explore this magical city. Venice, which of course has so much to offer, but why had the city granted Bugatti such a privilege? Venice is a city of art and of excellence, and therefore it is right to welcome Bugatti even just for one day. Each car is different from another. It is not an industrial product as such, but a craftsman-made product. Each car has its own characteristics. There isn't one that's exactly the same as another. Therefore, it is right to welcome Bugatti and that we reserve this very special place for only very important things. While the rally participants took in the delights of Venice, we moved to the new Bugatti factory in Campo Galliano, just outside the heart of the Italian supercar industry at Modena. Test work was progressing on their yet-to-be-launched four-door saloon, the Ital-designed EB112. But out on the factory floor, work concentrated on the six-speed gearbox, the mighty 3.5-litre turbocharged V12 engine, and the sleek carbon fibre body shell of the four-wheel drive supercar, the EB110. And here you have it, the finished product. A lengthy process that started with the delivery of a bare carbon fibre tub from Aerospatiale. When the factory's fully up to speed, they say they'll be building one of these things every day. Now, I won't say they're worried about my driving, but as soon as I said it, I wanted a quick run round the block, every red light in the place started flashing. Perhaps because we'd elected to drive not the boring old GT, but the Super Sport version. Extensive use of carbon fibre, over 610 horsepower, the potential to hit 220 miles an hour and accelerate from 0 to 60 in just 3.2 seconds. Michael Schumacher's got one and he reckons it's great, but then he's not a bad driver and it was raining ever so hard. Yeah. Oh, every girl crazy about it, shut down. 
Well, that at least shows the car is perfectly tractable and very easy to drive, and as you'd expect with four-wheel drive, immensely reassuring in these wet conditions. And in first and second, at least, it's blindingly quick. But a car like this is designed to go storming down the autostrada. Let's see how we get on. With at first grim determination, and then with barely concealed glee, I piloted this monster out through the traffic. And as I started to scratch the surface of the huge performance, the sensations just piled in. The grip, the cornering forces, and the arrow straight stability. Progress up the road is a series of great lunges as the turbo comes in over about 5,000 revs. This car just explodes. This feels very much the stripped out racer of the range with its simple floor covering and instead of a wooden face here you've got this carbon fibre. I suppose that's reminiscent of the turned aluminium dashboards of the old Bugattis. In the middle, a great big rev counter that's orange lined at 8,000 and red lined at 8.5, and, and a speedometer tucked under the wheel rim that reads round to 400 kph. That's a maximum speed of 250 miles an hour. This thing doesn't go that fast, does it? Well, I don't know. How do you know? But the Super Sport humoured me, forgave me, and ended up convincing me I really could handle all that power. You very soon learn that the only way to reverse your Bugatti in safety is like that. And if it's a day like today and you're in your best bib and tucker, it's a bit of a pain. Oh, and another thing. For your 300 odd thousand quid, you don't get any in-car entertainment. But then the Bugatti Super Sport is entertainment enough in itself. Back in Venice, breathless but unscathed, we were just in time to find the cars sailing away from the quay at the end of the rally. I buttonholed a beaming Romano Artioli, president of the new Bugatti company. How close did he think were the links between the old Bugatti and the new? If you forget the, the, the past in your activity, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, do the best uh, for the future. It's very important to maintain the, um, the feeling, uh, to maintain uh, the philosophy of the make. If Ettore Bugatti was alive today, he, you think he would have made a car like this? The people that is uh, working, uh, that has uh, work uh, with uh, Ettore Bugatti, very old one, when they have seen the car and the factory, they have said, if Ettore Bugatti uh, uh, has uh, the opportunity to see that. Uh, Schuar is uh, emotional uh, because uh, he's uh, the, the dream of uh, his life to do a factory like yours and uh, a car like this. 